But welcome to the Landmark Chambers webinar. The title is The Independent Review of Administrative Law, Much Ado About Nothing, or Rewriting the Rules of Public Law. Uh, we are delighted to see so many of you joining the session today and hope that you will find the presentations and discussions to be both useful and informative. My name is Richard Drabble QC and I will chair the session today. I will be joined by my colleagues David o Elving QC, Tim Bewley QC and Jenny Wigley QC who I will formally introduce in a moment. Uh, to begin with, a few housekeeping points to note. Your microphones are muted automatically, so you will not need to adjust your local settings. We very much welcome questions throughout the session. Please submit them via text in the question and answer section, which may be found at the bottom or top of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentations. This webinar will be recorded. You will receive a link to the presentation and the recording shortly after the event concludes, shortly after the event concludes. If your connection is lost at any point during the webinar, we will invite you to rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link once more. So can I start uh, by introducing today's speakers? The format is I'll introduce the three other speakers other than myself. I then have a few minutes, very short few minutes by way of introduction and a couple of slides to look at. And then uh, we will go on to the more substantive issues uh, with starting with Jenny Wigley. So let's introduce them. Jenny Wigley is actually our one of the new three landmark chambers silk. So we're delighted to see her in that, in, in that capacity. Uh, she practices in local government planning and environment law um, and uh, uh, appears at all levels of the, of the English court system. So we'll be delighted to, to hear her. David Elvin uh, will be known to many of you. Um, he practices in planning, environmental, public and property law and has appeared in many leading cases. Also a general editor of the Planning Encyclopedia, deputy judge of the High Court, sits in the Planning Court, and indeed as a recorder in the Crown Court. And he has also served for 10 years as a parliamentary boundary commissioner for England. Tim Bewley, Queen's Counsel, um, was known to me when he was a pupil in Landmark. He was his pupil a supervisor was Natalie Leaven, who was my pupil, so we're pupil godparents, grandparents, not godparents, grandparents, I think. Um, he and I appeared in the case called CART, which we will be discussing a little bit today, and it uh, might be a sadness to see that go. I regarded it as a great success. Uh, he's regularly appeared on the, for the A panel uh, before he took silk and is well experienced in practicing on uh, both sides of the fence, as it were, both for government. Um, and for claimants. That's a brief word about the speakers. Can I then move on to five minutes worth of uh, uh, my thoughts on uh, how we got here? Now, what, I, what I've done at the beginning, trying to ask where, where, we, where we've got here, if you go through um, the various material that's been produced both for the independent review um, and now for the government response, you will find the theme uh, that I've put on this first slide frequently set out. Quote, this is a quote from the IRL, uh, the introduction to the uh, review, uh, call for evidence, stated that the uh, panel invites the submission of evidence on how well or effectively judicial review balances the, the legitimate interests in citizens being able to challenge the lawfulness of executive action with the role of the executive in carrying on the business of government. So far, so bland in a way, Look at the, uh, looking at the balance. But then there was a very definite perspective being introduced by the panel. Um, quote goes on from the introduction, the panel is particularly interested in any notable trends in judicial review over the last 30 to 40 years. Specifically, the panel is interested in understanding whether the balance struck is the same now as it was before, 
and whether it should be struck differently going forward. So just picking out some of the salient features of that very short quote, the perspective that was being put forward uh, both when the review was set up and in the panel's own call for evidence uh, was that there might have been what the government regarded as unfortunate trends in judicial review over the last 30 to 40 years. So you stop and think where that takes you back, back to kind of 40 years back from say 2020 is back into the great flowering of judicial review in the mid 80s, the cases like uh, uh, National Federation uh, for the Self-Employed on Standing um, and a GCHQ, and as we will see in a moment on uh, uh, of Hoffman and Roche and the approach to validity. So there was the, the perspective that was being put forward at the time of the that the panel was struck out um, uh, was was set up was has something gone wrong over the last thirty to forty years? One of the issues that we will be exploring during the webinar is where the panel got to in answering that question. And you will see that the, um, the introduction went on to ask specifically, the panel is interested in understanding whether the balance struck is the same now as it was before and whether it should be struck differently going forward. Has there been a tilt, in other words, uh, towards um, towards active judicial review. Right. I set out on, on this slide so, uh, some of the general themes that we will be picking up this morning, sorry, this afternoon, rather, um, as, as we go along. General theme informing both call for evidence and now the government response is a general suggestion of judicial overreach. The courts are going to be much too active uh, so the government was saying, and we will hear this afternoon at the extent to which the panel thought that proposition was actually valid. Another general theme at a more academic level is uh, the, void, the distinction between void and voidable uh, decisions and the implications for remedies and ouster clauses. Because when we get on to look in detail at what the um, the uh, government are suggesting in their response, that, that distinction is critical to the workability of many of the proposals that are being put forward. The other general theme is justiciability. As is well known, um, a lot of the spark for the review uh, was Miller too. Um, the slides that have come up, seen by many as a classic example of judicial overreach, and which prompted the search for a clearer definition of the limits of judiciability. We will see um, during the course of the webinar uh, how much the panel's thinking actually upheld that version of the of a view of Miller too. Unison, which is the, ca the case um, about uh, tribunal fees, is also a case that is quite useful to bear in mind um, as an example of what the government at least thought was classic judicial overreach. Um, as, you, as people will know, the Supreme Court held that the fees that were being charged to go to the Employment Tribunal were unaffordable by ordinary people and for that reason incompatible with the statutory scheme. That decision was seen as an overreach um, and as being problematic in terms of remedy and indeed the application of the principle of legality. So that's the first theme. Um, the, second, uh, the second theme that I pick up uh, very, very shortly um, is, is uh, the uh, theme of the distinction between void and voidable. And somewhere I have set out the classic quote uh, from Lord Diplock in Hoffman La Roche, um, which is to the effect that, if, say, take a statutory instrument, um, the, the, the fundamental principle of administrative law, UK administrative law, is that once a court of competent jurisdiction has ruled on the validity of the uh, 
on, on the lawfulness of the uh, measure in question, in that case a statutory instrument, it should be treated as never having had legal effect. We would have to explore how compatible that is with the government proposals. So having said all that, we now know that the proposals of the review itself were relatively modest. Um, I'll leave others to say what they were. The government proposals in the fresh consultation that has now been launched go beyond those of the review panel and if Im implemented would be a major change to remedies in particular. And it may be worth um, just just finishing uh, by reading part of the introduction to the proposed the government proposal for the basis of the new the new uh, consultation exercise. And what that says is the government thinks there's merits in exploring the following areas to see whether practical measures could address some of the issues identified in the report by legislating to clarify the effect of statutory ouster clauses legislating to introduce remedies of which a prospective effect only to be used by the courts on a discretionary basis, legislating that for challenges to statutory instruments, there is a presumption or mandatory requirement for any remedy to be prospective only, legislating for suspended quashing orders to be presumed or required, and legislating on the principles which lead to a decision being a nullity by operation of law and indeed some other procedural reforms. The point to take away at this stage is the heavy emphasis in what I have just read on remedies. That seems to be the, uh, an issue which is, uh, uh, which is at the forefront of government mind, and in particular of fashioning remedies which are either, uh, which are perspective only, either at the discretion of the court or in the case of such instruments possibly, on a mandatory basis. But I should, that's, that's all I wish to say by introduction. We now, I now hand over to the next speaker, Jenny, um, to take us further forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, yes, uh, as Richard um, just said, um, it's, uh, it's interesting to compare what the government's proposals are with what the conclusions of the report were. And I'm, I'm going to deal primarily with the conclusions of the report, the panel's report. And uh, I'd ask you to, as I go through, compare and contrast what Richard just said in, as to the introduction of the government's proposals and where you find those, if at all, in the panel report. So just by way of introduction of what I'm going to be talking about, it's what the report recommended, but as importantly, what it did not recommend. So um, I'm going to deal with um, the main areas of the terms of reference, so the government's terms of reference. The main four areas I'm going to talk about are proposals for codification, issue of non-justiciability, moderating judicial review, and uh, I'll briefly talk about procedure at the end. So first of all, um, codification. The uh, terms of reference put forward by the government were whether the amenability of public law decisions to judicial review by the courts and the grounds of public law illegality should be codified in statute. And um, the sort of purpose behind that uh, was perhaps to make judicial review more easily understandable and accessible to the public. But the more cynical amongst us would also see it as a way of limiting what the government sees as judicial overreach and setting parameters and limits in statute as to the remit of judicial review. Um, the cuttings to the chase, uh, the panel report, um, quite clear conclusion uh, to that question was no. Um, and that followed a very detailed discussion of the pros and cons of codification by reference to other uh, common law regimes. So I'll just briefly talk about that, um, th those conclusions. Um, <clears throat> the panel saw two main options really in terms of codification. One was um, the statement, a statement of general principles, um, which uh, exists in, for example, Barbados legislation, which um, aims to bring together the grounds of judicial review in one place, 
and then sees them as being stamped with the authority of parliament and restating basic principle in simple language accessible to the general public um, while retaining the flexibility of the common law. So really having a fairly general and um, flexible uh, overarching def definition, sorry, of overarching statement of general principles, which remains flexible and which is really quite anodyne in the sense that it doesn't um, set any parameters. That's one um, way forward. Another way forward considered by the panel was to be more um, precise, list, list specific grounds of judicial review in, in statute as in South African legislation. And the panel recognised that that would be more in keeping with the UK way of legislating and statutory drafting. But it came to the conclusion, quite clear conclusion, that there is a danger in that the detailed approach both goes too far and not far enough. Um, in the sense that it um, is less accessible to the public because it's um, more detailed and doesn't really give the public a, a, a layman's view of what judicial review is. It's also more restrictive um, as to uh, the flexibility provided to the courts and misleadingly incomplete as it cannot uh, capture every form of judicial review. And um, the panel also noted Lady Hale's response to the call for evidence where she said, my experience as a law commissioner for nine and a half years has taught me how very difficult it is to encapsulate the subtleties of, of the common law in statutory language. And the, um, the panel basically uh, in, uh, endorsed uh, that statement. Um, so the conclusions of the panel on codification um, were uh, quite notable really in, in uh, emphasising the importance of judicial review as an essential ingredient for the rule of law, essential element of access to justice, constitutional right, and also uh, separately protected by the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, the a panel recognised that codification may well help set boundaries and may well um, sort of stamp parliamentary approval and give parliamentary legitimacy for judicial review, but um, was very concerned that the ability of the courts to interpret and apply the law in individual cases should not be restricted, restricted and should remain flexible. The panel also doubted how, whether it would really work this sort of statutory boundaries in any event because the courts would um, ensure that the statutory and formulation would always be seen as operating in the framework of the common law and we, and we know we know that uh, specifically in relation to ouster clauses um, which we'll come on to later. Um, the court also, sorry the panel also um, recognised that uh, whilst it may make judicial review more accessible in that the public will be able to find the grounds set out in one place in statute um, but on balance there was little significant advantage mm -hmm. because um, the panel recognised that the grounds for review are really well established and accessibly stated in the leading textbooks. So quite a resounding no in terms of um, codification. Non-justiciability uh, is the next um, topic in the terms of reference. Um, and the question there was whether the legal principle of non-justiciability requires clarification. And if so, the identity of subjects and areas where the issue of justiciability or non-justiciability of the exercise of a public law power and or function could be considered by government. So that covers um, the, the well-known issue of whether certain mm -hmm. powers should be basically off limits for judicial review. And obviously some is well established that some are, um, but whether that should be set out uh, in statute and whether some areas of uh, government power, public power, should only be challengeable on certain grounds. Again, cutting to the chase, the general answer um, from the panel, from the report, was, um, was no, um, although that is subject to a, a little bit um, more detail. So um, <clears throat> the courts, uh, sorry, the panel, I keep saying the court, the panel uh, undertook quite a detailed um, review of case law over the last uh, 40 years or so. And, and the more recent controversial cases, such as the Miller litigation. Um, but there was certainly no clear uh, conclusion that there has been a, a, a persistent case for, or, of judicial overreach. Um, the panel concluded that it's, whilst it's arguable there have been cases of judicial overreach, there certainly was no clear conclusion to that effect. And also when, you, when you're reading the report, I think you sense 
that certain members of the panel may have been more willing to give a clear, clear conclusion um, that there had been some judicial overreach, but there certainly wasn't a consensus across the panel that that was the case. Um, but nevertheless, um, the panel uh, did say that it's entirely legitimate for Parliament to seek to legislate in this area if it sees um, fit to do so. But Parliament's approach should reflect a strong presumption in favour of leaving questions of justiciability to the judges. Um, and uh, also pointed out that whilst um, cases such as the Miller 1 and Miller 2 may have been big setbacks for government and areas of great disappointment, they are constitutional cases in the particular circumstances, which are very much the exception from public law cases generally, and uh, cautioned um, quite strongly about leaping from the particular to the general in terms of bringing in wide sweeping power uh, changes to judicial review on the basis of a bit of disappointment on a particular case. Um, so uh, moving on, yes, so the um, panel, uh, as I said, did consider it was legitimate if the government considers it wise to legislate um, in relation to just justiciability, but very much put forward a, a narrow um, uh, uh, recommendation in, in that respect and really confined it to two main areas. One um, of the uh, fixed terms parliament um, repeal bill um, and, and the cart uh, the, the, the reversing the cart case, which we'll, we'll come back to, and which Richard mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the um, the panel kind of concluded that the um, that it is sensible, perhaps, for Parliament to, to legislate in response to very particular areas, but certainly did not recommend any of the broader options for legislation in relation to justiciability, and also. Um, perhaps surprisingly, given you, what you heard from Richard about the government's recommendations and the, or the government's proposals for consultation, certainly did not bring, suggest bringing in any wide sweeping um, ouster clauses or, 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 or suggest any recommendations as to how to use ouster clauses to ensure their effect, effectiveness. Um, in relation to the fixed terms parliament's um, repeal bill, the um, the panel considered that that was the, the, the clause three in that bill, which does um, is is in the terms of an ouster clause in the sense that it um, makes off limits um, the uh, power of dissolution or call to parliament, um, and also any purported exercise of that power. So really seeking to um, make that ouster clause um, robust. The panel considered that it's not in fact an ouster clause because. Um, it simply codifies what was the position prior to the statutory limit on um, dissolution of Parliament. So prior to the Fixed Term Parliament Act, the panel considered that the power of dissolution has always been considered non-justiciable. And of course, that's in distinction from the prorogation power, which was considered in Miller 2. But in light of Miller 2, the panel considered that um, making it clear that dissolution should be non-justiciable in the, the the bill was a legitimate and and um, potentially wise thing for, for Parliament to do. So to that extent, um, the panel considered that there may be uh, some narrow areas of legislation um, making those things clear, but certainly didn't um, recommend any of the broader options for legislation in terms of um, justiciability. So um, then there was a moderating judicial review, which can come, comes in um, uh, uh, quite a substantive uh, terms of reference from the government, which was whether uh, where the exercise of public power should be justiciable, on which grounds the courts should be able to find a decision to be unlawful, and whether those grounds should depend on the nature and subject matter of the power, and three, the remedies available in respect of the various grounds. So quite a wide ranging um, term of reference from, from the government put to the panel. The panel interpreted it as a little bit more narrowly because they didn't have a huge amount of time to consider all this in any event. Um, <clears throat> so they, they inter interpreted it as two questions. Should the grounds of review be tailored um, to uh, exercises of particular public power? And so should some, so effectively, should some grounds be excluded in some or all cases? Um, to deal with concerns relating to, on the one hand, judicial overreach, and on the other hand, uncertainty. Um, 
and two, should the remedies that are available for successful judicial reviews be altered? Now, in relation to the grounds issue, those concerns, as, as Richard mentioned, relating to judicial overreach um, in the first instance was whether, I suppose, whether the courts um, are, are disagreeing with the wisdom of government action and then manipulating the, the, the what some would say the vast array, but I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but the, the wide remit of the grounds for judicial review in order to morph that disagreement with the wisdom of government action into a kind of finding of unlawfulness. And some of the grounds that were um, highlighted were things like the principle of legality, which is quite an obvious one in that respect, legitimate expectation um, and error of fact. Um, <clears throat> I mean, to my mind, things like that are already quite well, but certainly error of fact is quite well defined. And it would seem very odd if um, a, a very clearly established error of fact wouldn't be a, a, a basis for judicial review, uh, given how um, the, the threshold for an error of fact is already quite, quite high. So anyway, those were the um, two areas. First on grounds, again, the clear answer from the panel generally was no. Um, it wouldn't be wise for the par for Parliament to try to tailor the grounds of judicial review appli applicable to particular exercise of public power. Um, and really, any concerns about judicial overreach, uh, the panel was quite firmly of the view, should be dealt with instead by judicial restraint. And um, there's some discussion of uh, this, this issue of deference to Parliament, which the panel considered should be better uh, described as respect for other uh, branches of the Constitution, so for Parliament and the executive. But the, um, the panel acknowledged that um, uh, one theme um, they said would like to emerge from their review is a continuing need for respect by judges for Parliament, but they emphasise that this is clearly rendered easier when there is evidence of real parliamentary scrutiny. So it's a, it's a balancing of the three um, pillars of the constitution in terms of making sure that, that, you know, that, that it's a give and take really. If Parliament have, have given the, been given the opportunity and have exercised that opportunity of properly scrutinising powers and legislation, then it's more likely that, that um, judges will feel able to exercise judicial restraint and respect for those other um, institutions. And in that context, the panel welcomed the fact that the Fixed Terms Parliament um, Act repeal bill, which I just looked at, is to be the subject of pre-legislative scrutiny by an all-party joint committee of the House of Lords and Committee, uh, and sorry, and Commons. So <clears throat> that will, in the panel's view, um, encourage the, uh, the, the the courts to exercise more judicial constraint because they will um, have more respect for the um, for what's gone on um, in terms of bringing that into force. Um, so um, the, an exception to uh, a, a, a general um, decision not or general um, recommendation not to interfere with grounds of judicial review. Um, was, as Richard um, adumbrated in his introduction, the reversal of the Supreme Court decision in Cart, which uh, established the principle of being able to challenge by judicial review um, the upper tribunal's power to refuse to grant permission to appeal against the uh, first tier tribunal. Um, and that is seen as a, a way around the rule that the refusal of permission to, to appeal is not capable of being uh, appealed to, um, to the higher courts. Um, the panel recommended that that rule be reversed or that way round be reversed so that the upper tribunal would be the final uh, tribunal in um, a, a, a permission to appeal against the first tier tribunal and of course that arises a lot in immigration cases. The basis of that recommendation was really statistics namely that there is a very large number in the panel's view of CART judicial reviews, they take up a lot of administrative resource and um, their analysis um, resulted in a finding that only about 0.22% of those cases um, result in a successful outcome for the claimant. Um, and on that basis, uh, the panel considered they're, they're not justified, they don't justify the, the resource. And I know that <clears throat> Tim's gonna be discussing uh, that finding in a bit more detail, so I'll, I'll leave any more on cart to him. Um, <clears throat> The other aspect of moderating judicial review, as I said, was remedies. Um, and uh, again, the 
panel declined the invitation by government to have any wholesale limiting or review of remedies available on successful judicial reviews. Uh, their answer to that uh, invitation was largely no. <clears throat> and their only recommendation in that area is that sections 31 be amended to give the courts the option of making a suspended quashing order, which is a quashing order which will automatically take effect after a certain period of time if certain specified conditions are not met. So um, basically an, an additional discretionary remedy in the court's armour, which can be used to avoid the mass inconvenience and uncertainty that could be caused by retrospective quashing in certain cases, such as perhaps the Unison um, case. Um, there's the, the, the panel report does discuss some of the conceptual difficulties around that regarding nullity, and I know Tim's going to be coming on to that in his talk. Um, so, for example, if, if something is um, found to be uh, unlawful, um, it's, it doesn't quite fit with the concept of nullity for the quashing order then to be suspended um, and conditional. Um, <clears throat> it's you know, potentially quite an innovative uh, remedy, but in my view, the discretionary element of that recommendation is important for many reasons. Firstly, it clearly won't be appropriate on certain exercises of power that are being judicially reviewed. So in individual decisions, for example, uh, decisions to grant planning permission, for example. Secondly, it, it, it comes from a, a sort of presumption or an assumption that uh, unlawful exercises of power are capable of being remedied by certain conditions set by the court. So are capable of, you know, perhaps remedying the, the consultation for, for bringing in a, a policy, for example. That, of course, won't be the case in a number, in, in many cases where uh, the exercise of power has been found to be more fundamentally flawed um, than, than, than in such a sort of procedural defects that I've, that I've just mentioned. So it, it, in my view, it's very important that that remedy uh, is not made mandatory, or even um, that there's any main sort of presumption that that remedy be used. But as we will see when um, uh, come on with uh, David's section of the talk, I think the government does appear to uh, want to consider and consult on making that uh, a mandatory, or at least a near mandatory, uh, remedy that the courts have to use in 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 certain or even in all cases. <clears throat> so um, that's. Uh, the, a brief look at the main substantive areas that the uh, panel has um, recommended. And um, I think you'll, you'll see when, when David and Tim come on to speak that um, the, uh, many of the government's recommendations don't really draw on the recommendations of, of the panel. So just briefly touching on the procedural issues, now, the, again, the government's terms of reference were quite broad, quite wide, um, and, uh, and looked at, uh, wants to ask the panel to look at um, a number of issues, such as disclosure, um, duty of candour, particularly on the effects on central government, um, possible amendments to the law of standing, time limits of bringing claims, um, principles on which relief is granted, rights of appeal, um, issue of permission, and costs and interveners. And just in relation to this, but also more generally, it's it's worth noting and it's very clear from the terms of reference that governments put out this consultation or put out this um, uh, terms of reference and, and uh, review very much coming from um, the perspective of central government and um, not considering um, the wider implications of, ju of judicial review for other decisions and, and local government decisions. And it's it's through that lens, I think, that the consultation needs to be looked at because um, there's certainly some distortion of the way it comes across because it's very central government focused. But in terms of the uh, procedure, the, um, the uh, panel, um, again, declined to interfere in a, a lot of um, the procedure, procedural issues that the government had asked it to look at. One of the reasons for that was because it simply didn't have the resource and capacity to undertake the um, research and uh, scrutinise and analyse the evidence that would be necessary to come up with any wide ranging reforms. So, for example, um, it, the serious impact of the cost regime in judicial review cases was highlighted in some of the evidence the panel received. 
um, and that impact on, on access to justice. justice. Similarly, impact of judicial review on defendants functioning. Um, also, uh, the panel didn't feel capable in the time it had and the resource it had to properly consider that. So it recommended that those issues needed careful study and research before any recommendations could be made. Um, as to rights of appeal, uh, it looked at that and considered there was no need for any change. Also stated that any temptation to legislate on the issue of standing should be resisted. Uh, no change to the duty of candour was recommended, although uh, the panel did discuss that the guidance could be clarified as to the timing of the need for disclosure and, and some of the substance, substantive issues, but no major change was recommended. And um, in uh, as to timing, uh, the panel said we would certainly not favour any tightening of the current time limits for bringing judicial review claims. So what did it recommend in relation to procedure? Well, three main recommendations. One was to abolish the promptitude requirement, which will be, I'm sure, welcomed um, by many because it's always introduced some uncertainty um, as to whether a claim will be within time. Um, and uh, that's now gone anyway from planning cases which have the shorter six week limit but not the promptitude requirement but anyway op uh, recommended a, a, a wholesale abolition of the promptitude requirement recommended um, introducing a formal provision for a reply to, to acknowledgement of service that already happens in many cases um, but it would would I think be recognized by everyone that clarity on um, the, there being a formal provision for that and the timing for that would be welcomed and give certainty and also recommended the criteria for permitting interventions um, should be developed and published perhaps in the guide, guidance for the administrative court. Um, just how the government's responded to those things in, in particular, um, it's uh, its consultation is on inviting the Rules Committee, um, the Civil Procedure Rules Committee, to consider adopting those, those recommendations, so abolishing the promptitude requirement, introducing um, a reply, formal provision for a reply um, to acknowledgement of service, and um, extending time limits um, for bringing judicial review by agreement in order to encourage pre-action resolution, so enabling parties to agree between themselves that the time limit is extended, whether that is offset by the potential adverse effects on third parties, um, introducing tracks for judicial review, a requirement for early identification of potential interveners in the claim, and um, the potential extension of time for uh, detailed grounds of resistance to 56 days rather than the 35 days. So those are all out for consultation. Um, and I don't think I need to say any more on that. And uh, I'll now uh, move on to introduce, um, to hand over to David on the first sort of substantive area of the government's response. So David. Thank you, Jenny. Um, the clarity of the situation which uh, appeared on the publication of the Folks report was rapidly uh, altered by the government's uh, own response, which despite the fact it had set the terms of reference uh, for the commission, um, uh, the government had decided, has decided that uh, it should bolt on some additional proposals for uh, consultation which extend beyond the recommendation uh, of the uh, uh, report uh, and uh, although uh, of course uh, the uh, false report had been a uh, false committee had been given a fairly tight timetable in which to report and uh, as they noted limited resources to carry out research into more detailed questions uh, nonetheless we have now bolted onto it uh, a narrowly focused consultation with the proposals in uh, what is section five of the government's response. And uh, there are some oddities if, if you read the Lord Chancellor's forward to the response, uh, which says he's interested in exploring proposals beyond those that folks uh, reported on, um, and uh, says that procedural reforms are pressing. And it just leaves one wondering why it, went, it wasn't included in the initial consultation uh, rather than uh, as a bolt-on uh, after the uh, committee had reported. And there's a, there's, a, there's a worrying tendency in that report, which is highlighted right at the beginning, uh, 
by the Lord Chancellor's own forward, which I've quoted at the bottom of the slide, which picks up uh, a point which in fact was rejected by the report. Uh, and, it, and it claims that the panel's analysis identified a growing tendency for the courts to edge away from strictly supervisory jurisdiction, becoming more willing to engage with the merits. Well, as, as Jenny's just indicated, that is not what uh, the report said. And indeed the report uh, in fact made it clear that it was unwise to draw conclusions from a few high profile cases such as Miller II. Uh, and indeed Lord Falk's interviewed earlier this week by Joshua Rosenberg on Law in Action and publicised on Joshua Rosenberg's blog, uh, I think on Wednesday. Uh, Lord Falk's made it clear that he didn't agree with what the Lord Chancellor has said about that growing tendency being identified. And as you see from his own words, I think we found out there were one or two cases which we particularly pointed out where there was considerable tension, but those were particular cases. We did not think there was an overall trend that you could extract from those particular cases. And indeed, um, uh, anyone practicing in the area will be quite familiar by the court's refusal to engage in merits. And there is a distinct concern that uh, as indeed the setting up of the uh, Falks Committee perhaps indicated in the first place that government is jumping to conclusions from one or two high profile cases and are using it as an opportunity uh, to tighten up uh, judicial control in an area where they themselves recognise in their response the need to maintain the rule of law, the need to maintain confidence uh, in government which requires that the courts be able to supervise appropriately um, administrative action and indeed what is ironic is in the context for example of the Miller case, Miller number two case the prorogation case uh, folks uh, identified uh, that in fact there wasn't even agreement amongst the judiciary in that case and, and quotes Lord Doherty in the uh, uh, outer house of the court of session rejecting the Scottish element of the case and indeed a three-man high-powered divisional court uh, in England also rejected uh, the uh, Miller II case uh, at first instance. So these matters are not straightforward even uh, within the judiciary and to say that they represent a general trend uh, and as the basis perhaps for justifying further intervention is, is somewhat disturbing. Um, and uh, Jenny's already dealt with uh, what folks said about judicial overreach and the lack of clear conclusions. And in fact, I've cited uh, two of them at paragraph six and seven, which uh, bear that out. Um, there is a tendency, I noted, reading the government's response, particularly the additional proposals, that there is um, a, a great emphasis on the principle of certainty and its contribution to the rule of law. And you're balancing the debate between upholding the rule of law and the rights of the individual and maintaining an efficient government. It's perhaps unsurprising, but nonetheless, it is there that there is considerable emphasis on certainty rather than other factors that inevitably are in play in judicial review, not least securing compliance with the law, fairness, and the vindication of individual rights. Uh, and it's quite clear that if you read section five, the additional proposals, it's, it's put very much in terms of giving greater emphasis to certainty rather than other factors. Those additional proposals uh, are interlinked and I've listed them from paragraph 11 of the government's response uh, and they uh, include a number of matters which Tim is going to touch on in a moment. Uh, I'm going to deal with uh, prospective remedies um, uh, and suspended quashing orders to be presumed or required. Uh, and this ra raises the um, issue of nullity, void and voidable, which has bedeviled um, uh, academics and administrative law for a long period of time, but has very limited uh, practical ramifications uh, in my experience. Uh, and the government accepts, you see, paragraph 12, drafting to legislate on these issues will not be simple, the government says. So it's open to considering whether these or other measures uh, could be cost effective. And they are alive to the risk of unintended consequences. Uh, particularly, one might add, unintended consequences from issues that have only just been raised following uh, a review which was limited in scope and in time uh, uh, upon which this purports to be an ex from which this purports to be an extension. Prospective remedies. This was uh, a, a point which did attract uh, folks 
our recommendation uh, is to amend section 31 to give the courts the option of making a suspended quashing order that will take effect after a certain period of time if certain specified conditions are not met. Um, th there are two cases where it was said that prospective quashing might be appropriate to alleviate concerns such as in Miller 2 about the overstepping of constitutional boundaries, in other words, to allow Parliament an opportunity to ratify uh, the exercise of, of power. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it would nonetheless, of course, still mark the court's view as to the illegality of the action. And cases such as Hurley and Moore, where the court in the past has exercised its discretion not to quash because it might cause inconvenience or prejudice, uh, and therefore only gives a declaration rather than quashing uh, the decision or the act in question. Uh, and it was uh, suggested by folks, well, a suspended quashing order would give more teeth to the court's view. You wouldn't simply giving a declaration, uh, you'd actually be uh, quashing in due course, but in the meantime, allowing um, uh, uh, the government to put in place uh, 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 remedial action in order uh, to correct the error. I'm not sure that the difference between a declaration and a quashing order is necessarily uh, uh, a particularly strong one. The government uh, has always operated on the practice that if there is a declaration that it's acted unlawfully, it treats, treats it as such. And I'm not sure that it would affect future action to rely on an earlier unlawful action simply because the court hasn't quashed it, but has declared it unlawful. Uh, and uh, uh, reference was made to section 102 of the Scotland Act, which does contain a power uh, for uh, prospective quashing in the case of excess of power by the Scottish Parliament or Executive. The uh, government was attracted by the suggestion because it would allow uh, acts uh, uh, in terms of subordinate legislation, particularly, or policy to remain in place for the time being but they wouldn't be able to be relied upon in the future. Well, I've just said I'm not sure that that's necessarily uh, an argument against declaratory relief and will mitigate its impact, i.e. the effect on public finances in resolving the problems, um, as opposed to acting in a reactive manner. Well, it seems to me that uh, if the court sets conditions for prospective quashing, the government is going to be acting in a reactive manner, but maybe just has more time. The difficulties were recognised, could lead to an immediate unjust outcome for many of those who've been affected by the improperly made policy. But it says, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this would be remedied in the long term. Uh, and of course, it recognises that folks made no recommendations uh, as such as to how to implement such a measure. And uh, the difficulty one can see is, well, what will you have to do in order to justify a prospective quashing order? To what extent is the court going to have to be satisfied that the conditions it sets uh, are sufficiently clear uh, and uh, that the government uh, is allowed uh, an appropriate period of time in order to put remedial um, actions into place and what they would be? Um, this is going to be bad enough in the cases of unlawful policy, but in the case of unlawful delegated legislation, even more so because that has a, a, a greater uh, possibility of affecting the rights of, 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 uh, of many individuals. Um, it's going to give rise potentially to complex post-judgment uh, litigation or at least dispute uh, as to whether um, what is being proposed is one which the court should uh, go along with. Is what is being proposed by the government sufficiently quick? Is it going to be sufficiently effective? Is it going to protect the individuals who have been prejudiced by the act which has been declared to be unlawful and to what extent will this require further procedural amendment to be made to part 54 to accommodate a process for dealing with it. The response doesn't grapple with those practical problems, <laughs> leaves it open to consultation of course, uh, and the implications for what appears to be extended or satellite remedies litigation or at least post-judgment litigation and uh, it says of course we're not committed to the proposal. Um, and it sets out a number of factors which it says may be relevant to paragraph 64, whether it would have exceptional economic implications. Well, <laughs> exceptional economic implications suggest that that's affecting government. What about the individuals for whom exceptional implications may be relatively modest in terms of, of governmental finances? Significant administrative burden. 
that's never been a particularly attractive argument to uh, an executive which acts unlawfully. Injustice would be caused by a prospective only remedy. Well, that, of course, would be targeted at the uh, individual claimant or claimants. Whether third parties have already relied considerably upon the impugned provision or decision, again, targeted at uh, parties affected. These, of course, underline the practical problems I've just touched on. And it does seem to me highly unlikely that you can simply tag on such considerations in the way that you uh, add uh, in judicial review proceedings, submissions about the exercise of the court's discretion as to remedies, or with the uh, statutory power uh, under section 31282C, where the court is satisfied uh, that the error uh, would not have led uh, to a different decision. Uh, those largely arise out of the evidence of the challenge. The question of what remedial action should be taken and what protection should be given to individuals in the meantime doesn't arise out of the facts uh, necessary to establish the unlawful acts or decisions uh, and would presumably have to be dealt with separately once the court had uh, uh, given judgment. Um, and uh, the response uh, becomes very concerned with the concept of nullity. And I know Tim's going to touch on this as well. So we're, we're doing a double act on nullity, particularly given the development of law post Anis Minnick. And you see what uh, um, Falk said at 358, it, it noted there was an issue because of course, uh, as the Supreme Court indicated in Ahmed, uh, if you've got a void act, which is a nullity, how can the court exercise its discretion uh, not to grant relief? Uh, if the act is null and void, uh, there is nothing, uh, there is no remedy in a sense uh, that needs to be given, simply the court's decision that the act is a nullity. Um, the response itself takes quite a lot of space, uh, 13 paragraphs with a discussion on what is a fertile uh, area for academic debate on nullity, void, voidable and the like, um, arising from this particular problem. Um, it's uh, regarded by government as running contrary to the principle of certainty. That is to say, if you have the concept of nullity, it, it, it's, it's more certain if the court doesn't take an approach to nullity, which leads to the voiding of the uh, uh, declaration of the act as void. Though one might have thought the finding of an administrative act as void is more certain than the application of the valid until quashed approach. And indeed, it strikes me that some uncertainty may arise more from the difficulties in predicting the result, which is not the point the government is making in its response, which refers to the effect of the outcome on government decision making. Um, Falks treated the issue in a fairly no nonsense fashion and basically suggested that one way of dealing with it would be just 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 to provide that notwithstanding those fact, uh, the factor of uh, uh, nullity arguments or the existence of nullity, the court should still have power. Uh, uh, and a discretion over the uh, exercise of uh, uh, judicial remedies um, and uh, refers to uh, the metaphysic of nullity, uh, a well-known phrase, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a matter, as I say, which, of which there's a huge amount of academic debate, but it doesn't appear that those issues provide that much of a practical problem in the courts and it's not something which is really looked at uh, in the government's rush to try and uh, uh, justify uh, adopting an approach to prospective remedies, uh, which may run contrary to Ahmed. And uh, if one looks, for example, at the latest edition of De Smith, especially uh, the paragraphs I've identified under the heading The Situation Today, you'll see that the problem could be regarded as more theoretical than real and to arise more from um, uh, a jurisprudential debate about the nature of judicial review than the practicalities of judicial review in the courts. There are evidently cases where uh, nullity uh, arises and there are evidently cases which the government accepts nullity will arise. Uh, the exercise of power for the wholly wrong purpose, for example. Um, Falks said one shouldn't, simply shouldn't get into this debate because it's, it's, too, it's too difficult to seek to resolve it. And they say the better route is simply to give the courts the freedom to decide whether or not to treat it as null and void uh, uh, and to grant remedies accordingly. The response treats the issue as more problematic, although it appears to agree with Falks. Um, and uh, it draws attention 
uh, to um, some academic suggestion that the interpretation surf surfaces with astonishing regularity and vigor of the standard theory of administrative unlawfulness. Well, it may be amongst academics debating this issue, but it really has to be questioned whether that is an accurate statement uh, of uh, the practice uh, of, the, of the courts in approaching uh, errors of law and judicial review. Um, and uh, it's notable that that is not a position which was adopted by Fulks. Uh, it has, of course, uh, implications uh, for the proposed presumption that quashing orders be suspended. Uh, because, of course, uh, as with uh, prospective quashing orders, uh, if the act is void, the theory is therefore uh, logically that you can't suspend a quashing order because the uh, act is a nullity and therefore there's nothing to quash. Um, and uh, the government is clearly keen, uh, as you see from paragraph 69, uh, with that as a potential remedy as well. Uh, and the government notes that there's currently a wide array of possible outcomes when legal acts have been impugned. And again, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the issue of certainty comes very much to the fore. The government further considers legal certainty and hence the rule of law may be best respected by a suspensive quashing of such provisions. Suspended quashing by default would focus remedial action on resolving issues related to the faulty provision. And it therefore proposes two alternatives, a presumption, a statutory presumption, which gives flexibility. And as, as Richard noted at the beginning, a mandatory suspension requirement placing the burden on presumably the claimant to demonstrate there are exceptional, there's an exceptional public interest in not suspending it, which seems to go rather far to the extent that uh, it's putting the burden on the claimant who's already established in this context the, uh, uh, that the uh, decision uh, is unlawful, um, that it should also not have a remedy uh, not because uh, the act is unlawful, but because there's a presumption against it and only exceptional public interest would justify it. It does seem to go very, very far. It may be that it's only intended to apply this to um, delegated legislation, not entirely clear from the government's uh, response. Uh, and uh, you note, as I've quoted in par from paragraph 70, uh, in both proposed approaches, the legal certainty is given higher regard than the government considers that it currently is, or would be with the use of the discretionary power. Both powers provide clarity and certainty to the use of executive powers. Well, that's fine, but the rule of law is not just about certainty. If suspension is presumed or mandated, or quashing is to be prospective only, I just raise a number of points for consideration. To what extent is this driven by a misguided view of interventionist judges? or on legal issues of academic interest, but which present few practical problems. Uh, does this give uh, too much emphasis on certainty of the, in the rule of law, as opposed to concerns with regard, for example, to unlawfulness and fairness? Ensuring that unlawful decisions aren't allowed to stand is a critical aspect of the rule of law, and the inconvenience aspect which the response focuses on might be seen as a fair price to pay to ensure good, good government. The response recognises the importance of the rule of law, which is why the proposals, to at least a degree, strain to try to balance the desire for certainty with lawfulness and the discipline judicial review provides to ensure good government and the protection of the individual. Will it apply to subordinate legislation only, particularly the mandatory suspension point, or to government policy, or even more generally? Does it apply to local authority policy formulation? Will it extend to statutory challenges which are brought on judicial review grounds, for example, to local plans, which can take many years to formulate and reach adoption? Uh, if you think about setting uh, conditions uh, for remedying in, in either um, suspension or uh, prospective cases, let's take a local plan as an example, where you have the quashing of an individual set of, of policies. And let's take a concrete example, save historic new market, uh, a judgment uh, in 2010 where I succeeded in persuading the court to quash the housing policies of the Forest Heath uh, local plan. It proceeded with a single issue review and all it was targeted to do was to remedy the defect that the court had found in the local plan which related to housing. It took 
until 2019, that is to say eight to nine years, <coughs> to bring in replacement provisions. So one of the issues the court is inevitably going to have to, and I'm pretty sure that's a statutory example, <coughs> and it may be the government doesn't wish to extend these principles to statutory challenges, but if that's the case, what's the logical distinction between a judicial review of a local authority's planning decision and judicial review on statutory challenge grounds under the Town and Country Planning Act of the Secretary of State's decision on appeal. Difficult to see. But if, if this is going to be typical of the sort of problem that might arise, the court is clearly going to want to scrutinise very carefully what the proposals are for remedial action. Is it compatible with finding individual decisions lawful? For example, where there's been unfairness or unlawful decision making in the cases of planning, housing, immigration, procurement, wider regulatory decision making. How easy is it going to be to accommodate the impact of decisions where the claimant makes out a case for judicial review? For example, the deprivation of benefits, unlawful treatment, failure to provide housing, discrimination, if it's to be suspended or prospectively quashed only. It goes beyond the limited evidence the courts will take into account in, uh, at the moment in exercising the discretion to quash or under section 31.2a, see plan B earth in the court of appeal where the court considered the discretion and the statutory power side by side and was clearly unimpressed by attempts to introduce new evidence to justify different, uh, a different decision or to, sorry to justify the decision remaining on, on additional grounds. Uh, clearly um, a prospective or suspensory uh, application will require some evidence at least to satisfy the court uh, as to whether it, it should grant that form of relief or whether the exceptional public uh, interest applies uh, in order not to suspend. How do you accommodate certainty and timing and remedial action which should follow a suspended or prospective order? For example, in terms of legislation in Parliament, which is less certain and speedy than subordinate legislation or amending policy or in terms of statutory process applying to local government. Will interim relief be required in the form of either conditions attached to the court's order or uh, in some other way. Uh, new procedural steps may be required as I've already mentioned uh, and uh, who will who will foot the costs of the subsequent discussion as to what form of order and what material is needed to satisfy the court as to the exercise uh, of its discretion to impose the power or not to exercise it in the exceptional public interest. Uh, is it going to be mandatory for the government to pay the costs of such, bearing in mind it predicated on the basis of uh, the claimant having already demonstrated an unlawful action. Uh, and of course the scope for argument over what may be exceptional public interest, how that would fit with individual decision makings or the decisions affecting the financial position of a group is of course difficult to tell at the moment. Uh, one could say in final conclusion that of course uh, Richard Drabble is clearly the, uh, the main target of, of the report, given that he was, uh, along with Tim, with the successful parties uh, in CART, which is proposed to be reversed. And I noticed today that uh, he's in a, a new survey as the second uh, most frequent advocate in the Supreme Court after Sir James Eady. So clearly um, uh, this uh, emphasis on certainty is another anti-Drabble measure. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over, hand over to Tim. Hello, uh, thank you, David. Um, I'm quite sure you're right uh, about this being an anti drabble measure and fair enough at that. Right. Um, I, I, I'm not going to repeat, obviously you've already heard a lot from everyone, everyone who's gone before about the general background to this. I, I won't repeat any of that and, it, and I won't repeat what David said in particular in terms of the detail about the mismatch between what the IRL report said and what the government has sort of spun it as saying. Safe to say that I agree with David that it's very problematic and, and rather depressing to see that the government's line about IRL doesn't really seem to be reflected in the report. Um, it's not just me or even me and David saying that <clears throat> another very eminent comment, well, another eminent commentator is Lord Anderson, who got very hot under the collar about this and made um, made quite a big um, quite a big intervention about how different um, what the government was saying Ireland was had reported from 
what it actually reported. So that's the general background. Um, and I'm going to just come through to specifically to a couple of the remaining proposals that haven't already been discussed. So as you've heard, uh, first of all, the government agreed with a number of the RL reports or Fox reports uh, conclusions. Um, you've already heard about the procedural stuff from Jenny. Um, but the other one, which I'm going to talk about, is the proposal to reverse the CART decision. In addition, um, the government has then made a number of its own proposals set out in, set out in paragraph 11 of its response. Um, and David's touched on some of those. I'm going to talk about ouster clauses and touch back on the nullity issue that he's also discussed. Obviously, there's an important distinction then between um, the first of those, CART, and the other two, which is that the first of those is supported by the IRL report, uh, although there's some, some problematic aspects to that. The other two are not and come from the government's own, uh, out of the government's own motion, as it were. Let me take CART first then. So what is CART? For those of some of you will know very well indeed, some of you may not, depending on the areas of law you practice in. So in CART, the issue was whether a decision of the upper tribunal, uh, in fact, in a child support case, not an immigration case, although there ended up being a linked immigration case in the Supreme Court, a decision of the upper tribunal to refuse permission to appeal to itself was amenable to judicial review. And the reason that why anyone would want, you might want to know why anyone would want to judicial review such a decision. Well, the reason is that um, by refusing permission to appeal to itself, the upper tribunal would cut off not only the ability to take the case further, but the possibility of any access being made to the higher courts. Because if you're given permission to appeal to the upper tribunal, you can then apply to the, and if you lose, you can then apply to the court of appeal itself for permission to appeal and so you get into the kind of traditional higher courts by that route and even onto the Supreme Court. Whereas the, the uh, upper tribunal potentially had this pinch point power at the refusal of permission to appeal to itself stage whereby it could then cut off further access to the courts. And so the worry might be, for example, this was certainly part of Richard's argument um, and, and I wasn't on, on his legal team, I was instructed by the Public Law Project, but one we supported one worry is you get a situation where legal development, as well as the what may be very important consequences for the individual, is cut off because the upper tribunal adopts a settled body of case law. And then there's no way of challenging that because it never grants permission to appeal to, even to itself to, to look at that case law again. So that was the issue. The Supreme Court decided that um, <clears throat> judicial review was available, and um, but that it should impose some limits on the way that that power of judicial review should be exercised and that was the second appeal tests. Um, first of all it said that it should only apply where there was an not just an arguable point of law as is the normal permission threshold for judicial review but an arguable point of general principle or practice and or, or alternatively that there should be some other compelling reason which might be found in light of the way case law subsequently was developed, for example, in, in, in really, really serious consequences of the individual, perhaps coupled with a strong case. So that's what the Supreme Court decided, and then a practice has developed since then, and there are particular provisions in the CPR about how those cases are be, to be conducted. In practice, what happens is that the court doesn't treat them as a normal judicial review, it looks at them only on paper, but if it grants permission, then unless the government then says it wants to fight, actively indicates an intention to fight the case, which it almost never does, um, then the case will automatically, the decision will automatically be quashed and it'll go back to the upper tribunal and it can proceed within the tribunal system. A couple of important points of context then about CART in terms of the, the court's reasoning. First of all, I'm going to come on to ouster clauses. It's really important to, I think, to say that CART, CART was not itself an ouster clause case. There was no ouster clause. Secondly, the government argued that the status of the upper tribunal as a superior court of record, that appears in the somewhere in the 2007 Act, which sets up the tribunal, it's a superior court of record. The government originally argued that that by itself was sufficient to ask judicial review. But the government lost that argument as uh, very early on. It lost it in the divisional court, although it won the case on other grounds at that level, and it didn't renew that argument in the Court of Appeal. So that point, it's quite important to say when we come to when we see what Irol says, 
that point was, was never got near the Supreme Court. And no one, I think, really su suggested uh, that the point was that what the divisional court said about that uh, was wrong. I've never seen anyone suggest that. I'm certainly not aware of any academic commentary. So that being so, the straightforward position you might think would be, well, here's a, here's a statutory tribunal. It's a, it's a statutory tribunal which is subject to the supervisory jurisdiction of the, the High Court. What's the problem? Why wouldn't judicial review be available? And furthermore, the context was that there was a long history relating to the predecessors to the upper tribunal. Um, so the Social Security, in particular, the Social Security Commissioners and the Immigration Appeal Tribunal, wh whereby this exact form of action, a judicial review of the refusal of permission, had been long accepted and was, and, and there were many, many examples of it with no limitation being imposed. That was as a complication about asylum and immigration tribunal, but I won't go into that now. But there was, however, some recent case law, in particular the Siva Subramanian case, which I'm going to come back to when I talk about ouster, which suggested that it, this kind of decision might be subject not to a lack of jurisdiction in the High Court, but to limits on how the judicial review should be exercised. And indeed, in Siva Subramanian, it was said that in relation to the equivalent challenges in the county court, um, <clears throat> That, um, that that judicial review would only be available in wholly exceptional circumstances, complete, completely egregious error of law. And that's the context in which the Supreme Court decided uh, that judicial review was available uh, and that it, it, there was no ouster. Um, and it applied the Siva Subramanian line, but modified it, recognizing the particularly important consequences for individuals in, for example, immigration and sometimes social security cases. Uh, which meant that a, a less stringent rule should be adopted, but there should still be some limits on judicial review. So that's what Kant decided. What then does uh, IRL have to say about it? Well, as Jenny has already said, it basically made a case based on statistics. Importantly, IRL doesn't, so far as I can see, purport to suggest that Kant was wrongly decided. It doesn't say the Supreme Court got anything wrong in its analysis of the legislation as it stood. It says only that there could be a policy-based case for altering the position by way of legislation. That's obviously a very different thing to say. Um, and it's important to say that, was, that, that this issue was not actually within IRL's terms of reference. And it, on this issue, IRL took a rather unique approach. There was an invitation, I think, from some judges to look at this issue. Cart has been very controversial with judges, especially as the Ministry of Court, for many years and was so at the time, because there was a sense of worry, no doubt, in some ways well-founded, that they might be overwhelmed by a lot of cases and or um, that some of those cases would not be meritorious. That's the context in which then IRL looked at the issue. <clears throat> but as Jenny's already said, the thrust of its reasoning is that by analysing some, it said, 5,000 odd cases, 5,500 odd cases, it was saying very few succeed. In fact, Jenny's already quoted the 0.22% figure. Uh, and so they said, well, look, effectively it's disproportionate to have so small a number of cases. But I think there are a number of really important things to say about that, about IRL, because on this issue, and I would say this is, as far as I'm aware, unique, um, I think IRL's report is really quite unsatisfactory. The first point to make is I've already won, it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't, with, this issue just wasn't within the terms of reference. And one, one important consequence of that is that the government, is that the consultees, Alba, for example, who I responded on behalf of, uh, bar council, many, many others, NGOs and so forth, didn't get, didn't address this issue at all, didn't say anything about Cart because they didn't know the issue arose. And so that meant that IRL had, was left to do its own homework on the statistics, and that's a pretty worrying context, I think. Secondly, I think it's obvious that the methodology which IRL deployed was really very problematic. And what's odd about it is that in a different context, when they're looking at the success rates for judicial review generally, RL recognised how problematic this kind of um, uh, um, methodology would be because just looking at reported cases, which is what they did, and saying, well, how many won and how many lost, is not going to get the vast majority of successful cases. And indeed, the danger would, I think, be much greater in the context of CART, where most cases don't go to final hearing because of the procedural aspects I mentioned a moment ago than in any other context. Then there's a problem. That the, Conclusions are in any event presented rather ambiguously. So for example, what IRL concluded is they found 12 cases of what they described as success. And I think by that they mean success, not only 
in the JR itself but in the final result. They were able to identify by looking at reported cases, 12 cases which were full on successes. The claimant finally won their case. And they say that that is out of the 45 such cases which they identified. Well, 12 out of 45 is not 0.22%, obviously enough. In fact, it's more like 20%-ish, I think, if my maths is right. Perhaps it's a bit better than that. Indeed, it may be a bit better than that. So that's not a, whether you think that's a great success rate, it's, it's a totally different success rate from 0.22%. Of the, the 5,502 cases, well, 5,450-odd, was cases where no conclusion was possible. And so those are conclusion cases where one simply cannot know whether the case has succeeded or failed. And so to present that as being a 0.22% success rate is just obviously wrong. So wrong, I think, is to say, so obviously problematic. So, so, so problematic, I think it's just, one can simply say it's wrong or nonsensical. Um, I can say from personal experience, they missed a lot of cases because I've pursued three such cases all around the time that court cart was being decided. Not only did, were all three successful as cart JRs, but they were all successful in, um, in securing a, a positive outcome for my clients. I know that one of, one of them still sends me a bottle of champagne every year, so I can say that with complete com confidence. And they were all cases which had fundamental consequences for those individuals. Now, that doesn't matter in itself. That's three extra cases, you may say. True enough. But I think the many I've or only in the last week or so since this was published, I mean, my, my impression speaking to other practitioners is that many others will have similar tales to tell. And there are other respects in which the data is clearly wrong and just one very egregious one. And I haven't tried to do the exercise which IRL purported to do, but the J, they cite the JD Congo case as an example of a case where a, a cart case which didn't succeed. So it's one of the 45, if you like, but not one of the 12. But in fact, and I happen to know about that case, so I looked, double checked it, it's not a cart case at all. And it's a case where three of the four individuals who were involved in the case succeeded. So it's definitely, it's just a, it's a pretty basic and fundamental mistake. Where does that leave us? Well, that's the basis on which IRL recommended the change. Um, what, does the, what does the government say? The government goes along with this proposal and it says, I won't read out the whole paragraph, but it says effectively two things. First of all, it says, it quotes, if you see in the first, um, the first part of this paragraph up to, up, if you can see the cursor, it com comes up with the 0.22% figure, which for the reasons I've given is definitely, de definitely wrong. And secondly, it goes on as follows. It says the government considers that rendering up a tribunal decisions justiciable by judicial review is contrary to the intention of parliament. This is because the upper tribunal was originally intended to be broadly equal to the High Court, and it goes on to refer to the Superior Court of Record Point, and it says that the Supreme Court got, got, got it wrong because it failed to take account of the Superior Court of Record Point. Now, as I said earlier, the Supreme Court wasn't even asked to look at that issue because that had been dismissed in the Divisional Court and the government didn't, didn't see fit to take the point further. So I think one can definitively say that both of the reasons that the government is now giving for abolishing CART do not stand up to scrutiny. The figures are obviously wrong, uh, and the basis on which CART is said to be wrongly decided clearly fails to understand the judgment. None of that, of course, means that CART shouldn't be overturned. I'm, I'm very aware, I mean, I speak as someone who's as I've said, has occasion to use the process myself and with success, uh, and I, it's dear to my heart having been involved in the judgment. But it is a pretty, I suggest, pretty, dip, but, but I can see that there is a concern, there's undoubtedly a concern, there's always been a concern amongst judges, that in reality the numbers of cases which succeed or are meritorious are not very high, and it is a disproportionate use of their resources. They may be right, I'm not in a position to say, but I think what ca one can confidently say is that the basis for reforming CART has not been made out in either the IRL report itself uh, uh, and, um, and nor, in the, nor in the government's uh, paper. Um, and it's a slightly depressing to, to, to overturn a pretty important constitutional judgment on, on so thin a basis seems to me pretty depressing. Um, there's also, I suggest, a failure to recognise just how important these cases can be to individuals. But in any event, 
one does need to recognise the reality. It seems very likely that notwithstanding those concerns, the government has its bit, has a bit between its teeth on this issue, uh, and it seems quite likely that it will try to reform CAR. That does, however, beg a much deeper question, which is even if you are going to try and uh, overturn CAR or reverse it, how are you going to do it? The only way that I can see of doing it, or the only obvious way I can see of doing it, and this isn't how, how they do it is not discussed in the consultation paper, is by way of the statutory ouster clause. Uh, and that brings me then to the next topic, because that is one another area where the IRL did not make a recommendation, but where the government uh, ha has, take, has taken that forward as a proposal. So, legislating to clarify the effect of ouster clauses. Um, this is, uh, it, just, just for the, again, some of you will know this backwards, some of you will be relatively new. Um, very quickly, what is, what, is, what is the debate about? Well, it's a, a very well-established principle, going right back to that important case that Richard met, has already mentioned, the Ernest Minnick case, and indeed, actually much further, that the High Court's jurisdiction to uh, test the legality of public body action by way of judicial review cannot be ousted by statute. In other words, a, a clause in a statute which says this, this decision, whether it be of the tribunal, the Secretary of State, or whatever, shall not be challenged in legal proceedings, will not be treated by the courts as effective unless some other mechanism for bringing the challenge to the High Court is, 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 is provided at the same time. Uh, original authority, well, the best known authority for that was until recently Ennis Minnick. Cart is important on the point as well. Uh, and now, very recently, we have the Privacy International case uh, decided in 2020. It's important to say for the debate that follows that there are two alternative bases upon, what, upon which that principle uh, has been sometimes uh, explained. The first is a principle of interpretation, albeit a very strong principle inter of interpretation, that Parliament is presumed not to intend to ask judicial review, and that words, even apparently clear words purporting to do so, will be interpreted in such a way that they don't have that effect. That always leaves open the possibility that if sufficiently clear words uh, are given, then they will be interpreted uh, differently. But uh, some pretty clear wording can be found in both the Privacy International and Alice Minnick cases, and the courts went out of their way to, 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 to were, were very clear that they shouldn't be interpreted to have that effect. The second, even more strong, more fundamental principle, but much more controversial, is the idea that Parliament simply doesn't have power at all to exclude judicial review because that's unconstitutional. There's much more to say about the basis of the principle, but that's it in a nutshell. And note that in the Privacy International case, which was decided by a majority of four against three, four of the four, in other words, the entirety of the majority, decided the case on the first principle. Only three of them decided on the basis of the second principle, but the one who didn't, Lord Lloyd Jones, left the point open. So it's all, you know, all up, slightly up for grabs in the future. So what does the government have to say about all of that? Well, sorry, just before we get to that, I just want to come back now to this Siva Subramanian case. Now, Siva Subramanian, like Cart, was not an ouster case. It was a case about whether there is jurisdiction to judicial review the, um, the county court, as it happens on Commission of Appeal decisions. Uh, and uh, what the Court of Appeal held was orthodox, fairly orthodox, yes, there is such jurisdiction, but then fairly radical, uh, at the time at least, didn't really have much uh, underpinning in earlier case law. It said that in the, ca the case of the county court, that the ju ouster jurisdiction, uh, sorry, that the judicial review jurisdiction should be exercised only in truly exceptional circumstances. And it's important, therefore, to, and it's important to what the government's proposing to see that the court got to that conclusion to limit judicial review to truly exceptional cases. And it got to that conclusion even without an ouster clause. And that is also in it, ultimately, I think, the basis on which Cart was decided, albeit that the jurisdiction was to be exercised somewhat more generously for migration type cases where human rights are at stake. So what is the government proposing? Well, paragraph uh, 91 sets out, it, it, it sets out its main proposal. Um, it does go on to say elsewhere, well, we'd really like some suggestions from anyone how else we could achieve it. But its substantive proposal, what it's proposing, is set out in paragraph 91. The government considers it most appropriate to legislate for a safety valve provision in how all clauses are interpreted. This would work in many ways, but it, essentially it would allow the courts not to give effect to an ouster clause in certain exceptional circumstances. It goes on 
in the same vein and talks about the Caesar Subramanian case. So what, in other words, is being proposed here is the idea of an ouster which would oust judicial review, but not for all purposes. It would leave open the possibility that in cases of true excess of jurisdiction, so the Social Security Tribunal decides to declare here uh, criminal cases or decides, decides to declare war, war in Iraq or something of that kind, in cases of true uh, or, 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 or really egregious public or error, something they do something really outrageous, that judicial review would still be available, but it wouldn't be available on the ordinary public law grounds. That's the proposal. What can one say about that in light of um, in light of in light of Privacy International and Caesar Supermania and the other cases which I've mentioned? Well, sorry, it's like too far. Um, I have to say, and I'd say this with no pleasure because it, it struck me as a particularly welcome proposal, but it's fair to say that there seems to be a strong case for saying the proposal of the kind outlined in paragraph 91 of the response would be effective, i.e. A, a safety valve, but not a complete out, ouster of judicial review. Um, if one starts from the proposition in Super Subramanium that the court itself can arrive at the conclusion that judicial review is limited to exceptional cases, then the strength of the presumption that Parliament didn't intend such a result by clear wording must become much, much less strong than it would be otherwise. So it seems to me that a court may well um, be willing to, uh, uh, to allow an ouster clause of that kind in some circumstances. I'll come back to what I mean by that in just a moment. Equally, insofar as there's a constitutional objection, um, it would seem to be something which the courts would uh, allow. But it's important, so in that context, in the context at least of a challenge to a decision of a legal tribunal, of a, a tribunal of limited jurisdiction, which is staffed by lawyers, it would seem to be the case that there's quite a strong likelihood that the courts would accept an ouster of that kind. But I do think it's important to, to, to limit oneself to that context, and it's the final bullet point here, but also on the next page, the first one. It is really important to think about the context here. If you're to, the context of most of the ouster cases and of Minnick and Privacy International and indeed CART, not a true ouster case but relevant to this discussion, is all of judicial review of a tribunal which is itself constituted by lawyers, in some cases very senior lawyers, they're uh, uh, um, independent and impartial for purposes of Article 6 uh, and, and so on. Uh, and in that context one can see an ouster clause being perhaps effective if it has if it's of the limited kind that the government is proposing. Contrast that, though, with the very radical proposal that was being put forward by the government at one point in the Internal Markets Bill, it didn't survive into the Act, which was an ouster not of the judicial review of a tribunal decision, but an ouster of a direct challenge to secondary legislation promulgated by the Secretary of State. It seems to me that the prospects of the courts upholding even an exceptional, even a limited ouster on that basis, must be very low. Um, final thought on this. Um, it's one thing to say these things can be effective. What the government doesn't really do is make the case for saying why they're needed, at least outside of the context of CART. Um, so I hope um, the, the context is necessarily one where the, there's no right of appeal to, to a higher court. Why is it thought that there's nece a necessity for excluding judicial review in those circumstances? That's not obvious to me in that case, I think is not made. I'll touch very, very briefly on ouster because I'm conscious that time is passing. Uh, the last topic, sorry, on, on nullity. Uh, this is my last topic. Um, this goes back to the debate that David touched on, um, the proposal to get rid of the nullity principle. But it's a very, very odd proposal because it's a very odd question and it's not at all clear that the problem which the government envisages really arises, or certainly arises in the simple way that the government is Im imagining. Now, of course, the, this debate is very important to the issue that David has already talked about, which is suspending quashing orders, because if, you, if a decision is... Uh, it, 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 but I don't think that's really about the nullity principle. And so what the government is proposed, seems to be proposing in the consultation paper, 
I think it's really important to say is not to challenge the principle which Richard outlined at the outside, the, the Hoffman LaRoche principle, that once a decision, a public law decision is declared unlawful by the court, it will be voided from the start. That principle, at least in the part of the consultation paper which discusses nullity, is not being challenged. The concern is with a distinction between decisions which will be voidable, that is to say, they are regarded as valid until they're quashed, but once quashed or declared unlawful, they will be treated as void from the start so as to never have any legal effect. That is, it seems, subject to suspension of quashing orders accepted as a general principle, and decisions which are a nullity from the outset. And the example that's given over the kind of thing which could be a nullity from the outset is of this, I don't think it's a social security tribunal, but a tribunal which is set up to deal with one thing, mental health or social security, purporting to, to try criminal cases, something of that kind. Something so obviously outside of its powers that the court never see, needs to say that it is uh, uh, um, quashed because no one would ever treat it as having legal consequences of any kind. Now, I won't read it out, but the point that's made in the dismissed passage, which I quote at the bottom of this slide, is that that's not, not really a not necessarily a purely a legal problem. There are really difficult conceptual difficulties about the nullity, void, voidable distinction. But the but the one that the government seems to focus on is a much more practical one, which is, well, there are going to be some kinds of cases where you just don't, but they're going to be very rare in practice, where you don't need a declaration of court because it's so obvious that what's been done is unlawful and no one would ever treat it otherwise. Anyway, that's the nature of the debate. It's, it's, either a, it's either missing the target altogether because there's no problem, or it's getting into really difficult, abstract, conceptual problems which are of great interest to academics, but which I think I agree with David, don't trouble the courts on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> what, does, what does the government propose? Well, very briefly, <clears throat> a, a, a statement, that the, a couple of statements of principle about how the nullity principle would work that only lack of competence, true lack of power should lead to nullity, that there should be a presumption against findings of nullity, and then legislating further on uh, uh, exactly where the divide between lack of power and mere intra virus error is, is to be found. That's the proposal. What can one say about it? Well, as I say, first of all, it's not at all clear, um, it's not at all clear how um, that the issue really arises. It's not at all clear how you're going to achieve this. This is very different from a bespoke tailored provision to reverse part or something of that kind. We're talking about a statement of general principle in the statute. And it seems to suffer from all of the problems of, uh, that the, the Fulks Review commented on in terms of codification generally. You don't clarify these issues. You merely shift the debate from a discussion of pre-existing case law to a discussion of the meaning of a statute, which will in any event be informed by the pre-existing case law. And so the problem is not resolved. Um, insofar as the government uh, is seeking to reverse a unison decision, I think it's just misunderstood that judgment, but I shall leave that to the questions if people want to raise it. Um, thanks very much. Right. Um, well, can, can I um, just say thank, a very warm thank you indeed to the three speakers for quite excellent presentations. Um, we have, in fact, come to a point past the uh, uh, the, the the time we had set for the end of the webinar, but um, we uh, we are committed to answering some questions if we possibly can. And I'd like just to have at least two. We may not know the answers to the questions. It's got a slightly different point. Um, so we're going to go, I'm going to go on with at least two rounds of questions. Um, uh, anyone who's participating, feel completely free just to leave now. I'm sure you will anyway, but. Um, uh, not, not to stay on while we go on with this exercise. Um, so kind of go go uh, kind of as many rounds as we can while people are at least still participating. And can I first of all just ask Jenny a question, uh, which is trying to get a positive spin on flexible flexible remedies. Uh, is there an argument for saying that claimants will benefit from introducing more flexible remedies into judicial review? For example, making a court less uh, anxious about declaring something unlawful if it doesn't bring a whole very unfortunate pack of cards down. Um, or uh, is uh, something to be taken from the legislation dealing with local plan challenges in the Planning Act, providing for a flexible set of remedies, 
which demonstrates the flexibility might actually help not only government, uh, but uh, but uh, claimants who are players in the seat. But I first of all, ask Jenny that, and then if any of the other uh, contributors wish, wish us to say something, that would be great. Jenny. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yes, I, I think the answer to that is yes, actually. Um, I think uh, you know, I've done quite a few local plan challenges and um, two of which have been successful. And, I, uh, and I've, well, actually three successful on the, uh, on the legal error, only two got a successful remedy. And I think um, I definitely noticed the court sort of give out a sigh of relief when they saw what remedies were open to them in section 113 of the 2004 Act because the remedies there are, are really quite flexible they en enable the court to um <clears throat> to you know look back at the local plan process which is multi-staged and involves both the local planning authority and a, an independent inspector and to look back at that and to consider which bits of it to treat as not having happened or not having been adopted which steps might not have you know the court can declare haven't been taken and need to be taken again and the court can be quite imaginative about requiring action on the part of the inspector or the local planning authority to remedy the errors that have happened and of course <clears throat> when you've got a local plan which has such wide um, implications across the local authority area and has taken in many cases many years to get into place the court i think it can be very wary of disturbing that whole apple cart and um, when they realize they can uh, limit their remedy to the particular policies that are under attack, although in the case of my most recent one, that was quite wide because it was all the, all the greenbelt sites across a whole local plan area. But when they can still limit it to some extent and then also limit the process, so not necessarily quashing the plan or the policy, but enabling it to be to go back to the inspector, enable the council to do what they need to do, it does mean you get the remedy. Whereas I think in at least one of those cases, I probably wouldn't have got the remedy if the if the court had been limited to quashing the whole plan, you know, particularly, or even just for quashing what you know the, the the policies that were under challenge. So I think you know that that's just an analogous. Obviously, that's not specifically what's recommended here, but I think that's just analogous to show that allowing that flexibility does benefit claimants and does mean that you do get um, the remedy if the court is very nervous about the more nuclear option which they might be limited to otherwise. So yes, I think that is potentially a positive aspect of these more flexible remedies. I think I think the difficulty, Richard, is, um, and I agree with Jenny on that, although I, I gave you my safe historic new market where it took them nine, nine years to replace the housing policies and there weren't that many quashed. Um, um, I think the problem with the uh, the remedies issue is not having the flexibility. It's the government suggesting that they should be set as presumptions or mandatory. I think it's very it, it's a good idea to give the court uh, a greater panoply of powers in order to deal most appropriately with the individual case. But it's this attempt to try and over prescribe. I think is the problem uh, for the reasons that, the reasons I've indicated. I mean, there, there is politics behind it, as 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 I've no doubt, and I don't imagine anybody else has. Um, and uh, and you can see that from the, the the Lord Chancellor's forward and that nonsense about uh, misreading folks as saying one thing when in fact it says it says nothing of the sort and this sort of press for certainty which is understandable and it's government likes certainty it's it's helpful to uh, for a, a administrative convenience but it's not the it's not the touchstone of the rule of law it's only part of it and so I think that the flexibility is a good thing but I think over prescription isn't. I certainly agree with that. <laughs> Tim, have you got anything to add? Are you happy with that? I shall agree with both speakers. <laughs> 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 right. Right. Um, Jenny, I know that you may need to go. Uh, um, yes. So I, I may, so. Just excuse me, in a couple of minutes I may just be off, but I'll stay, stay until I, I, right. can, I can. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got one question um, from uh, from the participants about whether the panel could address the proposals in the response for wasted costs in in, in, a, in some categories of immigration cases. That may be too too much out of the run of what we've been dealing with so far to be able to deal with comfortably. But I don't know. I mean, let's see if any of the panelists do have a, 
the views at the moment um, on that. Tim in particular may have, I don't know. I'll say one thing, if I may. I mean, first of all, I, I, I'm aware of, vaguely aware of these, and I, I mean, trying to keep up, up, up to speed with all of the government proposed, proposals for reform on all of these different areas is pretty difficult at the moment. And this proposal comes out, I think, of a review of immigration specifically. Um, but the only uh, one thing that's not clear from what's being proposed is to what extent it would differ from the current position, because it, although they talk about a presumption, it's not clear really what that's supposed to mean in this context. The one observation I would make about it, though, is that it does seem to me profoundly problematic to have a threat of wasted costs hanging over one set of one party or one party's lawyers, which doesn't apply in an even handed way to other lawyers. That seems to me really to well, be obviously unfair, possibly to raise questions under Article 6 insofar as it's applicable to the context. Um, because it means that there's a chilling effect on the way that one party conducts their litigation, risk averse, which doesn't apply to anyone else. That seems to me to be deeply problematic. Um, I, I think that threats of wasted costs are often thrown around in litigation by all, sort, all sorts of parties in ways that are a bit unfortunate. And frankly, it'd be easier if we could all get on with our jobs and not worry about that sort of threat. They're almost always thrown, thrown around in a way that's deeply inappropriate. It seems likely that this will encourage that, and that seems to me to be regrettable. Obviously, wasted costs need to be there for those very rare, but very problematic cases where people really misbehave. But I, I wouldn't want to see their, their use encouraged, and it seems to be fundamental that they have to be even handed in the court's ability to impose them. Thank you. Do you know, any of the other panelists have anything to add to that? No, I, I, I agree with Tim, and the, the difficulty is it's it's treating categories of case as inevitably being a waste of time. And having sat in several different varieties of the immigration jurisdiction uh, as a deputy, I mean, the difficulty that you have to discipline yourself with when you're looking at these cases is yes, there are a lot of hopeless cases come before the court or the upper tribunal, but you have always got to be alert to those cases where there are genuine points being raised. And it's always very care you've always got to be very careful not to assume that because eight of the 12 cases you've got in front of you are hopeless and they're all boilerplated, but that there may be others uh, that, uh, that, that have substance. And the risk of this approach is it treats a one size fits all sort of case. And I just think that's inappropriate. The judicial function is more than able to deal with individual cases. And that has been shown time and time again. And I just don't think there's a need for it. It's just an attempt to create a chilling effect uh, under a, a particular administrative uh, convenience, guys. I agree. <laughs> and I have to leave. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenny. Can I say thank you again? I'm no, no, all very no. grateful. Thanks. Uh, right. One uh, the question just come up on the question and answer board say, have these criticisms of the government's response to the review been raised formally with government, for example, by the Bar Council, or would the concerns otherwise be obvious to those dealing with this in government? Um, well, I spent a bit of today swapping emails with a team that's putting together a, a Bar Council response on the proposals. Um, so I think the answer will be that uh, Somehow or other, uh, 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 the, 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 the views of the Bar Council on these issues will, will get through. Um, yeah. Yes, of course, the, the, of course, the problem is, the, the, yes, of course, the, the paper's only just come out, so, uh, um, but uh, it's well, generated uh, a very instant response. I'm sure the... Yeah, one of the oh, sorry. sorry, Richard. Go ahead. <laughs> No, I was just going to say that one of the one of the troubles, the paper has just come out, and some of the issues, like for example, Annie's Minnick, it's not obviously clear what line something like the Bar Council should take. I mean, judges are split on it, the profession split on it, you could have academic theoreticians split on it. Um, so uh, those of us who might be, have to think about it uh, are still thinking about it. Um, and that process is likely to go on for a few days, <laughs> maybe longer. I think now, um, can, can yeah, for example, Alba's response, which I'm involved in, almost certainly will say is that very point. In other words, 
one of the problems with the consultation proposals is the mismatch between what our IRL said and has, has, has read it. And I think that's a legitimate point to make. Whether I didn't think any of us have to make those points so far, but I think they're important. I think I, I think the other difficulty which I which I touched on is that uh, as you say, Richard, I mean, it requires you to form a view on fundamental principles of administrative law uh, uh, and uh, the uh, development of the principles since Anna's Minnick. And frankly, you've only got to look at the fact that academics and the courts haven't been able to agree in the last 50 years. So uh, the, chance, the chances of reaching a, a clear conclusion on a consultation exercise is just opposed to taking a decision as to what way you want it to go um, is, 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 I think, a rather foolish hope. I mean, the problem, of course, as was highlighted uh, uh, and the government recognises, the law of unintended consequences, if you do start to fiddle with it, A, you, cr you, uh, you cut off legitimate um, areas of, uh, of dispute and challenge, but B, you may create others unintentionally by formulating things in the wrong way. Well, the, go the government, the Bar Council response to... Um to the uh, initial review, the folks review, um, made the point loud and clear that if you were going to do anything at all, this is a major law reform project. It wasn't something to be done on the back of a six week consultation period as the folks review was. And pretty well the same applies if you're dealing with a 12 week consultation period. Um, it's a much, much more significant reform than, than those sort of timescales allow for. Now, um, we're looking at the number of participants who are left. There are still some, but we are uh, 20 minutes past the time scheduled for finish. I'm going to call it a day now after embarking on a further round of, uh, of questions. So can I repeat the thanks to uh, all the speakers? And I think thanks to you to the participants who have stayed with us very loyally uh, up until the last few minutes. So thanks again for very much. And I hope it's been interesting. We will have a look at uh, a limited number of questions on the Q&A board, and we will have a look at whether anything can be sensibly said by the panelists in writing to those questions and provide them as part of the material. So otherwise, thank you indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.